Hey everyone, Anthony Rivera here from the Subway to Shape podcast, and yes, in video form this time. And I'm doing this with, in conjunction, the High Spot podcast. If you go on their YouTube page on High Spot podcast, you could catch me on there. You've seen my podcast on there, and now we're going to do a little bit something different. We're going to get into a little video here, and this is going to be exclusive content for the channel. And I'm very excited to share with you. You can follow me on Twitter at Subway to Shay. And you can follow my podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, you name it. My podcast is on there. Just check it out when you get the chance. A lot of episodes on there. Got a lot of good guests on there. And I appreciate all the support. And I really enjoy you guys listening in. Let's get into... What is a very frustrating week for the New York Mets? Now, from being in first place all the way to third place after a disappointing weekend series against the Philadelphia Phillies. And how poetic is it that to end this series, we get to face Zach Wheeler, who was once on this Mets team and now on the Phillies, a little, I guess, a little bit of revenge for him after the Mets not signing him. He throws a complete game shutout against the Mets, who have a, as you can think of it, a lifeless offense. They're kind of like dead in the wind right now. They cannot score any runs. They did not score any runs against Zach Wheeler. They couldn't do anything in the bullpen game on Saturday, and they struggled on Friday night. What is attributed to this? Is it the manager? Is it the ever-changing uh, batting coaches? What is going on with this offense? They're not hitting. They're not scoring runs. And it's just frustrating to see this day in and day out. So you can't really fire the hitting coach now because that will be two hitting coaches. You can't get rid of Luis Rojas right now because – what kind of message would that send to the roster who it all looks like they love playing for him? So what is there to do for this offense? Personally, really, I got no answers. They're just going to have to come out of this funk on their own. They're going to have to get out of this. They're going to have to stop hitting at 2-0 counts and swinging at 3 and O's, swinging at sliders that are into the dugout. They're going to have to do better. They are not hitting the fastballs at all, as we saw on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they're not hitting breaking balls. So this team is just in a huge funk. Every team goes through this. Every team goes through a funk at least once a year, and this has happened at the most inopportune time for the New York Mets. They need to get themselves back on track, and they could do it starting against the Washington Nationals. This is a team that has traded away everyone from Scherzer to Trey Turner, Kyle Schwarber, and the only guy they kept was Juan Soto. So this is a team that the Mets should be able to not only win a series against, they should sweep them. They should win all 11 games left that they have with the Washington Nationals. Will it happen? We don't know because this offense has struggled for the last two weeks very badly, and for most of this season. What can they do to fix this? Only time will tell, and hopefully Pete comes around. Hopefully Jeff McNeil continues his little hitting streak that he was on. Dom Smith, he's got to get himself uh, going and, and you know being more consistent in the lineup. James McCann is James McCann. You're going to get what you get from him. But the biggest culprit we have is Michael Conforto. Michael Conforto is kind of the poster boy of this offense. He struggled all year, batting close to, you know, under the Mendoza line to 200 this whole season and really needs to get himself going. If he can at least get himself going for this last stretch to get this team into October, that's a big stride for him. I wouldn't give him a big deal following that. But let's see if he can somewhat generate some type of offense. I've never seen someone on their walk year play this bad. And this is a very, very bad year for Michael Conforto. They're going to be waiting for 
Noah Syndergaard to come back and Jacob deGrom to come back and Francisco Lindor. But could it be too late? Like I said, only time will tell. But a couple of things that really bothered me with the Mets that happened this weekend is one on Friday night, Marcus Stroman with the bases loaded and no outs was told he was told not to hit and he should have hit. Maybe he gets into a double play. Maybe he strikes out, but you have to take the chance. You have to put the team, you know, in a position to score some runs and by taking the bat away from Marcus Stroman, yes, he is a pitcher. He may not be the best hitter, but just having him sit there for three strikes, you might as well only have eight people at bat and not even worry about Marcus Stroman or any pitcher of that matter coming up to bat. And one of the reasons why we need a DH. But for them to not have Marcus Stroman hit, and not at least swing the bat. I would have respected this decision if he swung the bat and struck out. But you can't go into a game saying, hey, you know, we're trying our best not to get into a double play. And that's why we did it. Because the next step at was a double play. First pitch, Brandon Nimmo, double play. And that whole strategy backfired on Luis Rojas. So what if Marcus Stroman gets into a double play? Who knows what happens with a bad Philadelphia Phillies defense? We saw Alec Bohm, you know, bungle all these different plays in uh, at third base. And it was a struggle for him. So you never know. Maybe an error happens. Maybe he gets a base hit. But you can't go into an at-bat thinking you're automatically going to get a double play. That's not the mindset you want for this team. That's not the mindset you want for this offense. And this is, seems to be why they're struggling so much. This team needs to be better offensively because they have been putrid. They've been disappointing, abysmal. It's been awful to watch over the last couple of weeks. And yes, I have to sit through these games and watch them. So it's just a struggle to continue to watch what has been going on with this offense. There's been no answers. And then you sit through these press conferences and one big thing from this weekend's press conferences was the comments made by Pete Alonzo. And boy, uh, this is a tough one because what is Pete Alonso supposed to do? Is he supposed to, you know, be angry and upset? He probably should state the obvious, that the offense stinks. He should state that. But he kind of didn't go that way. Obviously, he was going to defend himself, defend the players. And I don't know. He kind of took like a happier spin around it. When I went to go back and review this, telling the fans that, the, you know, just smile, you're watching baseball. Yes, Pete, I know. I am watching baseball, and I enjoy watching baseball. This is not what I'm enjoying watching, okay? I know that this is your job, but for me to take my time off on my job, when I stop and want to relax and watch baseball, I can't even enjoy it because the team's not playing well. Now, I don't fault Pete. Yeah, Maybe the words just didn't come out right. I don't know. But telling the fans to, you know, just smile, you get to watch baseball. I mean, obviously we get it. You know, we shouldn't take baseball so seriously. You know, it doesn't affect our overall lives. But baseball is a huge part of a lot of fans' lives. Some, some For some fans, it's the only outlet they have. So, and you know, you can't tell fans when to be happy, when to be sad. Um, you're playing in New York, and you got to understand that you know, these fans, and you said it, Pete Alonso said it on his presser. He said that the fans are a passionate fan base. And if you understand that, then you shouldn't get too frustrated and upset with them when they get upset. So, Pete. I would just suggest 
you get yourself back into the game, get back into hitting, swing at those fastballs, because we're going to need you. And we need the rest of this team to get things going. Moving forward, we've got a big couple of series coming up. Nationals, you're going to have to take care of business against, especially if you want to only stay within this two games out, you know, range in the division. Because the wild card, not happening. You're going to have to win the division. And right now, within a matter of three days, you're in third place. It's time to get moving. It's time to get back on track. This whole team has to get back on track, and they can't count on. Francisco Lindor, they can't count on Jacob deGrom, and they can't count on Noah Syndergaard coming back. I've said it in past podcasts. If you listen to the show, I've said that these pitchers and these guys coming back from injury, you just can't count on. That's why it was very important for this team to go into the trade deadline and make some moves. Bringing in Javi, Javier Baez, that's that's not enough. It just is not enough. So what else is going to happen with this team? Well, they got the Giants and they have the Dodgers in the next two weeks. And all I'm asking is for this team to at least go 500. Can they at least go 500? And then I would feel a little more comfortable. If they could do that, they have probably about nine games, maybe nine or ten games left with the Nationals, which is huge. They have, I think, they have some games with the Marlins. Uh, I think they only have maybe one more series with the Braves, and then they have a couple more with the Phillies. You know, this division is not over, Med fans. This division is not over. Yes, we're all upset and we're all angry. And I don't fault you for being upset. I don't fault you for being angry at all. Heck, I'm upset and angry too. But this team is not out of contention until they're mathematically eliminated. So never give up on the season. The Philadelphia Phillies will tell you that, and the Mets will tell you that from 2007. With 17 games left and seven games out of the division, it was impossible for the Phillies to come back. And they did. And they overtook the Mets. So anything is possible. And the Mets are only two and a half games out. So let's pump the brakes on this season being over. Yes, it's frustrating. They're struggling. It's awful. The offense is giving us nothing. The pitching is barely hanging on. But the season is not over yet. So just hang in there and be, I don't want to tell you to smile because that's, you know, Pete Alonzo. That's Pete Alonzo's thing. But you could be frustrated. You could be upset. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Who am I more worried about with the rest of this division taking place? Hmm. Let's think about that. We got the Phillies, who are in first place right now. They made their move. And they've been pretty hot with Bryce Harbor playing, you know, almost MVP level. Zach Wheeler, sad to say he's gone, but he's played very well. He might be the Cy Young now that Jake's on the shelf. You have Kyle Gibson, who I thought was a possible trade target for the Mets. The Phillies went out and got him. And you have Joe Girardi as the manager. So you got a veteran presence. The Phillies are tough. Braves aren't to be taken lightly either. They won the division last year. They went to game seven and were within three innings of going to the World Series. But the big problem is they don't have Ronald Lacuna Jr. anymore. He got injured. He's out for the season. What do we do between those two teams? It's tough to say. It's really tough to say. I would think that the Mets could have a better opportunity beating the Phillies than they would the Braves. They've always struggled against the Braves, no matter where they played them, whether it's in Turner Field or their new stadium that they have now, they've always struggled. But now the Phillies are on fire. You got to beat both teams and you got to win the games that you are in control of. 
continue to improve, continue to move on and beat these teams. And that's what's going to win the division because no one's going to get an opportunity to be in the wild card on this NL East. Or should I say NL East? Because this is one of the worst divisions in baseball right now. We all thought it was going to be one of the best divisions. Seems to have not worked out that way. And it's been a struggle all year round. So where do we go from here? We need to get this offense back on track. And we need to see Louis Rojas become the manager that he should be. He has the pedigree. He's got it in his family's name. Can he take the next step? Or will the analytics continue to run this team? Because that's what it feels like. It feels like the analytics is running the team. And not in a good way either, right? We all wanted to see analytics brought into the Mets. When Jeff Wilpon was running the team, they only had maybe about two, three people running analytics when teams like the Yankees and the Astros and even the Tampa Bay Rays had, what, 10, 20 people doing the analytics? Now the Mets are trying to get in analytics, and it's not worked to their advantage. They're not executing. And if this is what analytics is all about, I got to tell you, I'm not a big fan of it right now. And I know a lot of fans on Twitter. I've talked with a lot of you guys. A lot of fans do not like what we've been seeing. Is Rojas in danger if they free fall the rest of the season? Well, I think that he should not have been manager at the start of the season. I think with the new ownership, they should have went in a different direction. But I understood why they kept him. I understood that Louis Rojas kind of gave the Mets a window. Because if we go back all the way to when Steve Cohen took over this team, right? Right after the World Series, probably around October 31st, first week of November, he takes over the team. And a few days later, we get into free agency, right? But he only has Sandy Cohen. Uh, he only has Sandy Alderson as a team president. And then he has to build the front office. So he brings in Zach Scott. He brings in Jared Porter as the GM. And that didn't last too long because of all the issues Jared Porter had. So now we have to bring in Zach Scott as the acting general manager. And then you're asking this team to build a roster and, you know, get ready for spring training. And then spring training comes, the season, we get the season underway. The Mets don't get to start because of the COVID and the Nationals. And then we get all these rainouts. It wasn't the greatest start for a Mets season and not a great start for Steve Cohen to, you know, his first year being the owner of this team. So I think, you know, making Rojas that constant kind of made everything feel okay for the Mets. Now, I've been a consistent complainer on Louis Rojas and things that he's done wrong. But I've also given praise for things that he's done right. There are moments when you think that he could quite possibly be manager of the year. And then there are moments, like on Friday, not letting Stroman hit, and on Saturday, taking Dom Smith and Jeff McNeil, your two hottest hitters, taking them out of the lineup. Those are things that boggle my mind. Or how about putting Edwin Diaz in the eighth inning, knowing that he has struggled in non-safe situations, or he has struggled when bringing him in with men on base. So Lo Luis Rojas has his ups and downs. The big thing for him is the players love him. And you can see it in the press conferences. They have this kind of uh, relationship with him. And I, I don't know. I just, I don't know if he hangs on if this team continues to fail or if they continue to go down this route of failure and free fall completely. I don't think Luis Rojas will stay on the team. If he makes the playoffs, he might be the manager again next year, even if they lose in the first round. 
But then you got to think, if they do fire him, who do you replace him with? At this moment in time, I don't know who could possibly be an available manager. I mean, Mike Socia maybe? Or they're going to want to do what they did this year and get someone who's going to listen to the analytics and you know be on the iPad and converse with his, uh, his coaches. We don't know what's going to happen with Luis Rojas. And I hope that we kind of see a turnaround for this team that he does be able to manage going forward. You never want to see anyone get fired. And I, I get the frustrations, but, you know, people want Terry Collins. You know, they want him to be fiery like Terry Collins. And this is a manager that they also wanted to fire in, you know, 17, 18, and 19. I mean, 2017 and 2018. So Luis Rojas, they said that he's going to stay on for the moment in time. Uh, we will have to see moving forward. If this team continues to free fall, he's probably a goner, and we'll probably move on from there. But as of this moment, Luis Rojas will remain manager of the Mets. With Steve Cohen, is the honeymoon with Steve Cohen over after a lack of activity at the trade de deadline. I mean, for a lot of fans, yes. A lot of fans, you know, can be impatient. Obviously, I was not a fan of the work the Mets did at the trade deadline this year. Just getting Javi Baez and Trevor Williams wasn't enough. And even giving up a first-round pick for him, when you see teams like the Yankees get Anthony Rizzo and Joey Gallo and give up nobody. So for the Mets to... Get Javi Baez kind of really didn't need him. Yes, they needed a shortstop to come in and play for Francisco Lindor, who's going to be out for a while. But they could have gotten Javi Baez in the offseason. So why was this move necessary when they needed pitching, pitching, and more pitching? Yes, the team's not hitting. But I said for the longest time that this team needed pitching. With Jacob deGrom out, with Carlos Carrasco out for as long as he was, and with Noah Syndergaard out, this team needed pitching. You can't always count on Marcus Stroman, although he's been the best pitcher on the team. You can't always count on him. I know his record doesn't convey that, but he's been one of the best pitchers on the team. Taiwan Walker, he's run out of steam. And Tyler McGill has just come up from you know, double and triple A. So these are guys you can't, you know, consistently count on, especially when they haven't pitched that much. And obviously there's going to be inning limits. Tyler McGill's going to get to it. It seems to be affecting Taiwan Walker. You know, Carlos Carrasco, Noah Syndergaard, and even Jake to a certain extent are going to be have to be held with kid gloves. So the team needed pitching. Obviously, they couldn't get Max Scherzer because he didn't want to come to New York. He wanted to go to L.A. He wanted to help the Dodgers. You didn't go Cal Gibson route. He went to Phillies. The ransom that they were asking for for Jose Barrios, I didn't understand. Um, but he went to Toronto. The only other option was Kenta Maeda. And they were on to detach uh, Josh Donaldson to him. And I don't know if that was a trade that I would do. The Mets were kind of in a hard spot because their farm system is depleted. It, it is. They, they have a top 10. But if you're not going to trade any of your top 10, then you're not going to get anyone. They don't have enough pieces in the farm system to move forward and make some of these big trades that you think they would want to make and the fans think that they should be making. So getting Javi Baez, I think, was just made to, you know, appease the fans and basically appease the roster. Because if the Mets did absolutely nothing, then what would that show? But now looking back on it, was it be would it have been smarter to do nothing and just let this season play out than to give up a top prospect and bring in a rental? Because we don't know if Javi Baez is coming back. 
We don't know if he will re-sign with the Mets. There is a big chance he could. There's also a chance that he won't. He might test free agency. And that, moving forward, is going to be a big thing coming in the offseason. Also in the offseason, what are we going to do with Michael Conforto? He has not hit well. He's kind of the poster child of this offense right now that has been struggling all year. Him batting 200 and under the Mendoza line does not help this team. It does not help this team at all. So will he get a qualifying offer? Is it worth giving Michael Conforto a qualifying offer just to get a draft pick? Because odds are he might take the qualifying offer, which will be about $20 million. So is a draft pick worth maybe getting Conforto $20 million? I don't know. I don't really know. It's going to be a struggle to see what comes of Michael Conforto. Probably would have been smart taking that deal in the offseason with the Mets. But Francisco Lindor is signed long-term, and that is going to be your big guy going forward. Um, So as we wrap up, this show right here. I want to thank you all for joining me for my first ever video for Subway to Shea. You can follow me on Twitter at Subway to Shea and follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever podcast platforms you listen to. And don't forget, Don't forget why I'm here right now. And that's because I am on the HSP Network, the High Spot Podcast. Make sure to tune into all their great shows, especially the High Spot Podcast, which covers all things professional wrestling. Always tune in every week. They got great content. And I thank them for having me on their network to provide you with some exclusive content. So for Anthony Rivera... Thank you for watching Subway to Shea on the HSB Network.